Greetings, beautiful people. Uh, well, before I launch into my weekly monologue, uh, I just want to let you know that um, my interview with the brilliant writer and investigative journalist Whitney Webb uh, has been, well, it's been removed from my YouTube channel. Uh, but that being the case, you can still see it. You can still see the whole thing uh, on my Rumble site. So get across to Rumble and see it there. Um, and uh, if you want to support my work, the rest of it, please subscribe to both YouTube and Rumble channels uh, and check out my Patreon.com site. That's a goodie. Uh, if you go to Patreon.com, look for me by name, uh, you can support the channel in a very practical way. Um, you get early access to all the new content as a quid pro quo and exclusive, completely exclusive access to a question and answer video every week. Uh, it's a great site. Come along, stir yourself into the mix and help make it even better. Okay, let's get back to the monologue. We hear a lot about the threat of uh, financial Armageddon about uh, fiat currencies uh, being little more than Ponzi schemes, uh, about, you know, the trillions of dollars of debt hanging over the United States of America, to name but one. Uh, they've got $100,000 being added to their debt total every second, every second of every minute of every hour of every day. Uh, the running total at the moment is apparently $36 trillion, a truly unimaginable number. Um, and, and that's not to mention an estimated $200 trillion worth of derivatives, uh, whatever they are, hanging over, uh, well, the, the global financial markets like the darkest financial cloud imaginable. You get the picture. Uh, a picture in which dollars, pounds, and euros, you name it, uh, are, to coin the cliche, not worth the paper they're printed on. Well, and this is not a thought about money, money. It's that it seems to me that there's another currency out there, or, or another sort of currency at least, of more fundamental importance in the scheme of things, but much more crucial to our safety and well-being, that has been even more devalued, perhaps utterly devalued, worthless. And that is the truth. The truth. I, I say it, it's hard to deny, far less to overlook the fact that knowing the truth no longer seems to matter. That telling the truth is positively dangerous for the average Joe. I say a person can tell the truth until he or she is blue in the face. And if that truth flies in the face of what the powerful want, what the powerful want to do, then possession of the truth makes no difference to the way events unfold. The truth no longer has any, well, traction, you might say. You know, the wheels are spinning, but the clutch is gone. And the gears don't mesh, going nowhere. I would say the rot set in on the truth a while ago. It's hard to be specific, but there are signs. If you look backwards, you can see them. I would say one of the first worrying signs was when people started talking about their truth, my truth, as though the truth was purely subjective. You, you know, rather than something certain, uh, inviolable, like gold maybe the truth has switched somehow into being something debatable, something that exists only in the eye of the beholder. Now, if, if we accept that the truth is not absolute, not an objective reality, or on the contrary, that the truth is whatever someone says it is, then the truth is another fiat currency, perhaps the most valueless of all. So if the concept of my truth was a, a, a worrying first shot across the bows of common sense, then more recently we were invited to accept 
the newly minted term malinformation. Malinformation. Malinformation is related to, but actually, and it's important, quite distinct from disinformation and misinformation that were also being bandied about at the same time. Malinformation is, and I'm not making this up, information that is true, but inconvenient. Inconvenient to those in authority. So-called malinformation is information that cannot be refuted. And so it's simply silenced and censored into oblivion. And this is, this is admitted. <laughs> this is not denied. That's what malinformation is. George Orwell, everyone quotes George Orwell all the time now, but you kind of have to. He alluded to the same idea in 1984, in the novel 1984, when he wrote, the party told you to reject the evidence of your eyes and ears. It was their final, most essential command. And there's no doubt, none at all, that more and more people are taking the next step you know, onto which they are led from that rejection of the evidence of their eyes and ears uh, to choosing to self-censor, just to keep their mouths shut, to keep their opinions to themselves on the grounds that what they know being the truth won't save them from destruction of one sort or another if they say it out loud. Now, what bothers me most of all is simply that knowing the truth and then telling the truth has become at best like whispering into the hurricane. When the truth no longer matters, when it is as devalued and debased as, as a fiat currency, then the otherwise powerless, those in society who, who most depend upon the protection that ought to be conferred by knowing and telling the truth, are left with absolutely nothing at all. In a world in which the truth is nothing more than whatever the powerful say it is, then the powerless are utterly defenceless. So let's have a look at when the truth doesn't matter, when it's been shown that it doesn't matter. Now, another term a lot of us have grown familiar with in very recent years is excess deaths. Now, for several years, more and more people have been dying than might have been expected based on statistics. Not just here in Britain, but in many countries around the world, especially the most developed countries as it happens, countries with the most efficient health services, for example. MPs, members of parliament in this country, elected representatives, those to whom citizens are supposed to turn for help when all else fails. Elected representatives, many of whom received letters and emails from their constituents voicing concern about excess deaths, have, with but a few honourable exceptions, a number to be counted on one hand or perhaps two, refused to ask any questions, far less to demand answers as to why thousands more people have been dying every year than used to be the case. Or at least it used to be the case until the Office for National Statistics, the ONS, changed the way they record deaths a change that made the trend of worrying excess deaths disappear from one day to the next, as if by magic, you might say. But we all know that you know, young people, not only, but also young people, athletes among them, drop dead on the field of play in such numbers that we've grown used to it. They don't make headlines anymore. There's another one gone, face planted on the football pitch or whatever. But to say it's a, a worrying development, at least, you know, a worrying new normal, to offer that much up as the truth is, well, it can be problematical to go down that path. And it's in that way that 
the, the truth about how many people were dying, are dying, was made to go away. MPs have, I would say, as Orwell imagined in his novel, learned to reject the evidence provided to them by their own eyes and ears, or at least via their constituents' eyes and ears. Medical interventions that were pushed on the public as safe and effective have been proven to have been neither, neither safe nor effective, not in the, the, the way in which we all understand those terms. People have died. Uh, people have been permanently damaged. And yet, next month, which is to say September, five EU, European Union countries, Belgium, Germany, Greece, Latvia and Portugal, will pilot a new vaccine passport scheme. Making, I mean, that makes plain that, that, that even while so many questions remain unanswered about the trend toward making such interventions ever more routine, perhaps practically unavoidable for anyone wanting to just go about the business of daily life, that, that, that so much truth has been exposed that ought surely to demand consideration at least. Well, it, it's in that context I say that the truth matters not at all. I mean, and remember all the stuff we were told about face coverings, about magic arrows on shop floors, about keeping six feet of distance between ourselves and others. All of it made up on the hoof. Just thoughts from off the top of people's heads. Lies, a reasonable person might say. And telling the truth about any or all of that at the time was social and reputational suicide. And it still is to some extent, if you go raking over those coals. And, and those responsible for all of it even freely admit that they made it all up. But, but consequences are there none. The devalued nature of the truth is it spreads insidiously through our lives. It's like it's like rising damp through the house we're living in. I mean, the examples are all over; they're everywhere. I mean, men cannot swap their XY chromosomes for the XX chromosomes that make women women, and yet, to tell the inevitable resultant truth that men cannot be women might land a person in all sorts of legal hot water. And, and, and what about e everyday truths? Like the fact ultra-processed food, you know, the product of seed oils and the rest. Your products that in in increasingly dominate the diets of the people of the developed West. You know, ultra-processed food causes obesity, causes diabetes. It causes all manner of autoimmune diseases and a swathe of other chronic conditions besides. It's literally true to say all of that. Big agriculture, food manufacturers know all of that. And not to mention our governments. All of that's been made available to our governments as well. But to all intents and purposes, that truth, like the rest of the truth, makes no material difference. If if a state wanted to, it could fix all of that in a matter of a few years. It could turn all of that around. More and more people around the world get fatter and fatter, sicker and sicker, children among them, and negative consequences for those responsible and complicit are non-existent. Nothing's done. The truth of the toxic nature of so much of the food that is pushed on the public, pushed into children, simply doesn't matter. Other things are pushed into children too, literally pushed via needles. And yet when one specialist after another asks questions like why, within a couple of generations, a condition like autism has gone from being something a general practitioner might never see, might never have seen during the course of an entire career, to the present situation in the state of California, just as a for instance, where the incidence of autism is now one in every 22 children. The silence is deafening. 
No, I don't know. I don't know what's going on there. Okay. But it's undeniably true that something has happened, that something is happening, and faster and faster. But requests that explanations might be found, that the truth of all of that might then be revealed, those requests fall on deaf ears. Don't talk about it. The truth matters and means less and less. It might mean nothing at all. Before the 2020 elections in the US, there were true, true reports, as it turns out, regarding the contents of a laptop owned by Hunter Biden, son of then would-be President Joe Biden. Much of those contents, it was alleged then, related to money sent to the big guy as a share of the profits from dodgy business dealings involving companies in Russia and China. Ukraine. That truth was ruthlessly suppressed with the complicity of social media and mainstream media. Now, a 291-page report has been published, a report compiled by three House committees that alleges the Biden family and the Biden family's associates profited to the tune of $27 million by peddling access to Joe Biden when he was vice president under Barack Obama. $27 million. Cha-ching. Now, the, that report, now it's, coming out of the, it's coming out of the establishment in, a, in the States. It, it further alleges that President Biden therefore committed impeachable offences. And yet, will any of that matter at this week's World Democratic Convention, for example? It's my suspicion, my expectation, that none of that will matter, that no meaningful consequences will result from the exposure of that truth. And the relentless attack on the truth is everywhere you look, which means, effectively, I mean, there are other symptoms, but the, it, it, the social contract is as dead as the proverbial dodo, the social contract between the, the people and the state. Now, the authorities would plainly have us accept that it's simply their way or the highway. Do as they say and not as they do. Take a telling and keep your mouth shut while you're at it. And, which is most telling of all, accept that the truth is what the powerful say it is. And whatever they say it is today, you have to accept it may well be different tomorrow. Social media is awash with well, memes offering variations on the same theme, the same exhausted theme, which is to say the truth is a lion needing only to be set free to take care of itself. Now, that's a fine thought, but it's increasingly hard to invest it with much faith. How can we when so much truth has been revealed and yet the lies just keep on coming? The reality of the situation is that the powerful in control of government, in control of the media, in control of the police, in control of the judiciary, and the rest of the institutions that function as the levers of power have used that power to pull the teeth and claws from that lion. The truth, as we used to hear from the X-Files, is already out there, but it's rendered as powerless and defenceless as a newborn baby. For the foreseeable future, all it seems we can do is continue doggedly to seek the truth and know the truth. That much might be all there is for now. <laughs>